Okay, uh, if everybody will settle in, we're going to uh, start our, our shir. All right, this is, uh, those of you who have been learning with me in the past, we've been doing Parshat HaShavua. This year we're going to do something a bit different, as I announced. We're going to be learning Chumash Bi'iyun. And what that means is, uh, when you do Parsha, basically you pick one topic from the Parsha and you speak about that, and then you skip a lot of other things. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be going step by step through Sefer Breshit and trying to understand a lot of the stories that are familiar to us from a different perspective. Today's shiur is a, a bit of an introduction, and it's an introduction by setting the stage on an issue that I feel very, very strongly about when it comes to the study of Humash, and that is the distinction between Pshat and Medrash. <coughs> the distinction between what the Torah actually says and rabbinical exegesis, which is, it's a a wonderful word, nobody knows what it means. Um, Rabbinical interpretation, which often goes very far afield. And the problem that I see, particularly when it comes to the teaching of our children in many of the schools, is that we jump immediately to Medrash. And children grow up feeling or Mm -hmm. understanding or believing that there are things written in the Torah that aren't there at all. And what happens is, and we grow up with that concept, we grow up with that interpretation as adults, rarely returning to the text in a critical fashion to look at the text and to really understand what it is that the Chumash is saying. And when that happens, we understand neither the Pshat nor the Medrash because we don't ever look at the straightforward interpretation of the text, and we don't understand what the Medrash is trying to do, what the rabbis are trying to do when they give these interpretations, which, as I say, often go very far afield. We're going to take a look at three examples from Sefer Breshit of where everybody knows the the Medrash, or many people know the Medrash, but the Pshat is often missed. And the Medrash is often misunderstood. Let's take a look at the first one, if you will. This is on the fourth day of creation. Fourth day of creation, the Torah says, Vayomer lokim yihimo wrote birkiah hashamayim, let there be luminaries in the vault of the heavens, labdil bein hayom u bein halayla, to separate between the day and the night. Vayul moros birkiah hashamayim, lohayir al-oretz, they will illuminate the earth. Vayas Elohim et shnei ha-mo'orot ha-gedolim, et ha-mo'or ha-gadol l'memshelet ha-yom, v'et ha-mo'or ha-katan l'memshelet ha-laylo, v'eis ha-kochavim. And God created the two great luminaries, the great luminary to rule during the day, and the smaller luminary to rule during the night, and the stars. All right, now... There are a whole series of questions that, that arise from this text. What are the lum- If there's light in the first day, how come the luminaries are only created on the fourth day? What was the light of the first day? All those kinds of questions we're going to take a look at another time. We're just looking at one puzzle. We're just looking at that sentence that's underlined. Now let's remember that our belief is that there is absolutely nothing extra in the text. And, and no, there's no verbiage, there are no words that are in the text that don't need to be there. What's your problem with that sentence? God cre- Exactly, right. Why doesn't it just simply say, and God created a tamo'or ha-gadol l'memshelet ba'yom, v'tamo'or ha-katon l'memshelet ba'layla. Why does it first say the two great luminaries, and then say the great luminary to rule during the day, and the small luminary, you didn't need that first et shnei amarot hagdolim. So does anybody know the Medrash? Yeah. All right. Both the moon wanted the, 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 that, the sun and the moon. And the reason you know the Medrash is because the Medrash is quoted by Rashi. Yeah. Right? But it's a Medrash that actually is found in the Talmud itself. And let's take a look at it, because most people only know the beginning of the Medrash. It's really a very beautiful Medrash, if you continue as well. Rishimon ben Pazi Yomer. Ben Pazi says, Vayas Elohim, why does it say the two Amorot HaGdolim? Because God created the two luminaries, the sun and the moon, 
of equal size originally. That's why it says the two great luminaries. And what happened? The moon complained. Right? The moon complained. The moon turned and said, I'm looking at the second line, but you can look at the English as well. Uh, Heavenly Father, is it possible that two kings can rule with one crown? In other words, you're, you're creating a problem here. You're, by creating us the same size, we're going to what? We're going to vie for power. We're not gonna, there's not going to be one who's the ruler and one who's the subject. We'll be vying for power. So Amror, the fun of Ribbon Shalom, so God says, since you said that, Dovar Hagin, since you said that, what should, what should you do? Lechi umeati es atzmech. Dear moon, since you're complaining, right? All right, go reduce yourself. And that's usually where the, the, the knowledge of the Medrash ends, because that's all that Rashi really quotes. But as I said, the Medrash goes on. The Medrash then says, Rubono Shalolam, Hoil Marti Lifanecha Dovar Hagun Amit Etatsmi. So the moon said to, to God, I'm in the last paragraph on the first page, but again, the English goes on to the next page as well. Since I told you something correct, Right? My, my, my argument is a correct argument. I should diminish myself? You're punishing me for nothing. The Medrash then goes on to say that God tries to appease the moon in a whole variety of ways. Until finally the Medrash says God sees at the end that no, the moon's not satisfied. The moon's not happy. So what happens? Take a look, it says, the Medrash says, if you take a look at the carbon that is bought on, brought on Rosh Chodesh, which is, Rosh Chodesh is the moon's time, right? Rosh Chodesh, because we are Chodesh follows the, the moon. If you take a look, it almost sounds like it's a kapora for a Kodesh Baruch Hu. God is saying, this is a, I'm bringing a carbon because I did something wrong. Kaviyachol. I made the moon, I was found it necessary to make the moon diminish itself and therefore I'm atoning for my, for what I did. Fine. That, that's the Medrash. All right. Now, I am teaching at Yeshiva University a number of years ago. A group of students. And they are, they're, they're, these are students who have Gone to gone to Hebrew school or to a yeshiva, but of limited background. And I come to this pasuk and I say to them, "Okay, tell me what you know." They said, "Well, the moon the moon complained." And the moon. All right, I said. I turned to them and I said, "How many of you think the moon can talk?" <laughs> right. All right. The man in the moon. All right. Right. How many of you think the moon can talk? So they said. <laughs> They, they, they didn't know what to say. I said, let's, let's, um, let's imagine for a moment, and now this is even more true than when I said it. I said, let's imagine, you, we are, you, I'm raising this question to you in the safety of the four walls of Yeshiva University. But let's say you were on another college campus and someone brought this text to you and said to you, and you quote it, this medrash because that's what you learned <coughs> and then that person said to you how many of you think the moon can talk what would you be able to answer and we're asking our children to, to sort of believe things this is what I mean when I say that we go, go immediately to the medrash we're asking our children to believe things that, no, that, don't, that they don't necessarily need to believe under those conditions right? and making things more difficult so now let's, let's examine the Medrash for a moment before we go to Pshat. The Medrash, why do you think the rabbis would have said this Medrash? What do you think the lesson they might be teaching would be? Why would they suggest... Don't be jealous. 
the wages of jealousy cause you to diminish yourself. All right? In other words, that's one possibility. The, the rabbis have a lesson that they want to teach. And what they do is they look at the text and they say, wow, we can teach that lesson using this text. And it's a lesson that we want what? We want to travel across the ages. And this is a powerful lesson. So therefore, using the text, the rabbis will what? Will, will take this text and say, yes, it has its own meaning. But now let's, let's find other lessons we can teach. And that's what the Medrash is. See, not, every, not everyone agrees with this, but many, many feel that Medrashim are not meant to be taken literally. I know that sounds revolutionary, right? But Medrashim are not, Medrashim are teaching tools by the rabbis. And I can show you classical commentaries that, that are very clear about this, that Understanding the Medrash, the key question is not the historical veracity of the statement. The key question is what? What are the rabbis trying to teach? Now, let's take a look at the Pshat. Why would it say, We got a problem, all right? If we don't take the Medrash literally, then we're still stuck with this textual problem. So I remember very interestingly reading... A, a book, I forget the name, a scientist wrote a book on Breshit, and he said, you know, there's a miraculous thing. From the perspective of man, on one level, the sun and the moon are of the same size. Not illumination, not in terms of illumination, but in terms of circumference. It is miraculous that standing where we stand the circle of the moon and the circle of the sun are of equivalent size. How, how do I know that? The of the because sun. you can have an eclipse. And it's almost that's, perfect. that's an almost perfect fit. Now, imagine if the sun would have been a little, more, a little closer or a little more distant, or the moon would have been a little closer or a little more distant. Life wouldn't have been possible here on this world. At least not, not life as we know it. And therefore, what you have is you have something miraculous. From the perspective of man, you are looking at Shnei Hamoro Tagedolim. You are looking at two great luminaries of equivalent size. Et Hamor Hagadol. But when you talk about what? Illumination. Aye, one of them is great and one of them is smaller. So that is, that's a beautiful shot. That's text. That's looking at the text and saying, wow, what a, what a miracle... I, that I didn't realize is underscored by a couple of seemingly extra words in the text. And that's what I mean by saying understanding the Medrash and its place and understanding the text. Let's take a look at the second case. The second case is actually, to my mind, very, very, very timely. In fact, I wrote about it a little bit in the Torah Tidbits. It's very timely. This is, this is a, a, a pasuk that is one of the strangest sukkim in the Torah. Let's, let me tell you the setting. We are now looking at the second generation of mankind. And the lesson of the second generation of mankind is be careful with your mistakes because your children will perfect them. All right? What happens is you've got Adam and Chava sinning and then denying the sin and trying to get away from it. And then you go to the second generation and who do you have? You have Cain saying, Hashomer Achim. Right? So, and in other ways, his sin parallels but takes a step further the sin of his, his parents. We're going to learn that when we get to it. But the Torah comes to a climactic moment in the story of Cain and Hevel. And that climactic moment is when Cain kills heaven. Let's take a look at that pasuk. Vayomer Cain el hevel ochiv, vayibi el samba sode, vayokom Cain al hevel ochiv ayargev. Cain said to hevel, and it was when they were in the field, 
and Cain rose up on against his Now, look at the word Achiv repeated, right? To say how bad this was, it's his brother. But what's your question about the text? What did he say? Exactly. He didn't say anything it, to him. Well, it, he's, the Torah's telling me he said something, but he, right? But the Torah so leaves it out. Now, if it would have said, it would have been less of a problem because means he spoke to him. Vayomer means he said. And nowhere in the Torah other than this, to my knowledge, is there a place where it says, and he said, and doesn't tell you what he said. So in jump the rabbis. All right, here's, in, the rabbis jump into the breach. And you have a very, very strange medrash. Nechama Leibowitz interprets, we're going to see how Nechama Leibowitz interprets this medrash. Kayin, Vayomer Kayin al Hevelochiv. The Medrash is at the bottom of page two. And again, the English carries over into page three. What were they arguing about, asked the rabbis. Your question. It's the rabbi's question. They turned to each other and they said, listen, we're the only ones really here, except for our wives, right? Let's divide the world. Let's divide the world. So they divided the world in the way the rabbis often divide things between what's known as karka and metaltalin. Karka is what? Real estate. Metaltalin is movables. All right? So one of them said, okay, I got all the land. And the other one said, okay, I got all the movables. All the what? The movables. Right, I mean, right. I have all the the, the the things. I have the things. You have the land. Real estate. Right. I mean, in our world too, there's a difference between the real estate and the movables. Right. So what then happened? The one who said, "I get all the land," turned to his brother and said, "Okay, start flying. You're on my land. Right. You're on my land. Get off my land." And the one who said. I get all the movables, said, okay, give me back my shirt. And they started fighting. And that's what they said. Right, so that's, that is suggestion number one. There will be three suggestions in this measure. Suggestion number two is no, they divided everything equally, the land and the movables equally. What was the problem? One of them said, okay, it gets stranger as we go. <clears throat> the base Hamikdash is going to be on my property. <coughs> and the other one said, no, the base Hamikdash is going to be on my property. And once they started delineating that, that claim, what do they do? They fought. And finally, you have the last suggestion. Rabbi Ovo, Evo says, uh, Rabbi Huda Bar Ami says, they were arguing over a woman. Right? One of them was at one suggestion is they were arguing over their mother. All right? Another suggestion is that twins were born with each of them because the Torah doesn't tell us who they married or who was created, right? And there was an extra twin. So they were arguing over the extra twin. One of them was, one was, I guess, was triplets, I guess. Okay. Now, let's stop there. This is very strange, right? What do the, what do the rabbis have a right to suggest these things? They weren't there, right? And they're asking us to believe that Cain and Hevel were arguing about the Beis Hamikdash. The Beis Hamikdash was, this, this, you know, had no no concept of that at the time of Cain and Hevel. So what are they what are they saying here? So I'll tell you what. Any ideas? Any suggestions? What the, what the lesson might be here? Yes? It's a third choice. What's the, yeah? I'm not sure what it is, but that's, that's the, the, lesson. the lesson. is, in other words, that yeah. there's another choice. There's another choice. That it could have been any one of these. Okay. All right. All right, so the, I think you're close. I think you're close. What? Ah, the humble Leibowitz takes a step further. Chama Leibowitz says, if you take a look at human history, 
and you look at all the bloodshed that's been spilt, it has been spilt over one of three things. It's either been spilt, been spilt over possession, over religion, or over lust. That's it. That's it. That sums up the totality of warfare in human life. And I said, I said this is very, very, very pertinent. And I should have said at the beginning, by the way, I should have said at the beginning that we are dedicating all our learning in, in, in this class and throughout as for as long as it will be necessary to the welfare of our soldiers and to the return of the hostages and to the return of the soldiers safely back home after they do their job. <laughs> but says Nakama Leibowitz is saying, we haven't moved one step off the killing field of Kayan. Right? That's really sobering, isn't it? It's really frightening. That's what we've killed each other about. But that's the Medrash. So the Medrash is, is giving us options, not necessarily saying we know what they said, but saying we got to tell you it had to be one of these things because those are the three things that we fight about. But what's shot? And this is powerful. By Yomer Kayin El Hebel by Hebo Samba Sadeh, Kayan said to Hebel, and the Torah doesn't tell me what he said. What is the Torah teaching me by the omission? That it doesn't matter what he said. That's shot. That Kayan maybe had an had a had a had a reasonable argument. Maybe he had a good time. Maybe there was something he but you know what? There is nothing you can say that can forgive, that condone the killing of your brother. There is no taina in the world that can condone the crime. That, 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 and therefore, the Torah says, I'm going to tell you he said something, and I'm not going to tell you what he said because it don't matter. It doesn't matter. Right? And look how, look again when you look at the text, and it's so powerful. It's the only place in the Torah where it says he said something and doesn't tell you. And the Torah wants to teach you by that omission volumes. And of course, that's what our war now today is about. There's nothing that condones the kind of atrocities and the kind of uh, approach to, to, to the life that Hamas represents. There's nothing that condones. Look, they are killing their own civilians. And they come right out and say it. They come right out and say it. They say it. It doesn't matter that thousands of civilians will die. We're, we're making our point. Unfortunately, the world, in, in large measure, it's, it's interesting, you know, it's interesting that, that some of the world leaders are, are much better than, than the world this time, right? In some cases. Um, uh, because I think they realize what Hamas represents and the danger that it poses to, to the free world. All right, finally we're going to take a look at the last one. All right, now this one takes us further into Bracious, into the patriarchal era. And it takes us to, to what many will say is Avraham's greatest test, and that is the test of Akedas Yitzchak, the, 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 the test of the, the aborted sacrifice of Yitzchak. And that test begins, if you'll take a look at page three, with three words. Vayiachar hadvorim ho'ele, ve'ho'elokim nisa es Avraham, vayomer elav Avraham, vayomer hineni. It was after these things, that God tested Avraham, and God said to Avraham, Avraham, and Avraham said, here I am. So the first three words, Vayhi achar hadvarim All right, now I, I'm gonna ask you a question that I've asked in class before. Does the Torah follow chronological order? All right, the answer, very good, all right. The answer is what? 
That's correct. That's my answer. The Torah follows, always follows chronological order except when it doesn't. All right? Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? The Torah is, you see, we learned a, ver- a very famous rabbinic statement. Ein muk damumu harbat Torah. Right? The rabbis will say, there is no chronological order to the text. They never said that. They said those words, but they never said there's no chronological order to the text. What they did say is that sometimes some commentaries will find the order in the text difficult and on those unique circumstances under certain cases, they will say this doesn't follow chronological order. All right? Once in a while, according to some commentaries. The Ramban, for example, Nachmanides, fights against it entirely. He says the Torah is always chronological, except when it tells you it's not, unless it says, this came first, this came at an earlier time. So in other words, the Torah is always following chronological order. If the Torah is generally following chronological order, then what's the problem with the first three words in that sentence? Why does it have to say that? Right? In other words, why does it ever have to say it was after these things? Why does it ever have to say it was after these things? And sometimes it will say, sometimes it will say, why does it ever have to say that? Okay? So, what would you suggest? They're connected. Correct. Correct. Right? They're connected. The problem is that in this case, the connection is very hard to see. Because the, we'll look in a moment at the event, we'll look at it more carefully, and it's also very timely. But the event that immediately precedes the Akedah is a covenant created between Avraham and Avimelech. That's the event that comes right before. And all the commentaries look at it and say, what's the connection between those two events? It's not clear. So Rashi, right on the spot, will jump right into Medrash, which is what Rashi will do at times. And we're going to look at his, we're, soon we're going to look at his grandson, the Rashbam, and we're going to see that the Rashbam takes Rashi to task at times because he, Rashbam is my favorite classical commentary because he always tries to stick with Pashup Shat. He always tries to stick. And he takes his grandfather to task periodically saying, my grandfather will do it. In fact, in fact, at one point I believe he says, my grandfather told me that if he would have rewritten his perush, he would have stuck closer to Pashup Shat. What? I think it's Vayeshev. Vayeshev, he says that? Yeah. Okay, Shkoyach. Good. Take a look if that's where it is. Now, here Rashi jumps immediately to, to, to Medrash. And he says the word, and he quotes from the Gemara again, the word devarim, with a little bit of a twist, can mean after the, not after these things, it can be after these words, diburim. And he says, what were the words and he suggests two possibilities. One possibility is that the Satan, Satan, now, by the way, we don't believe in a Satan that is independent as an entity. Satan is an angel. What's an angel? An angel is a messenger from God. And most will, the easiest way to understand angels is to understand that they are representations of aspects of God that help us bridge the chasm between man and God. In other words, some say they are actual entities, some of them say they are visions, some of them say they are, but they are, they are basically entities, real or vision, envisioned, which, asks, which represents certain aspects of God. And Satan is not an independent being. It's a prosecutor. It's that aspect of God that <coughs> speaks of harshness or din or judgment. 
So Satan comes to the to the to God, meaning, and says, you know, Avram made a party when Yitzchak was born, and everybody had a good time, and they all ate, but he didn't offer a carbon. Didn't offer something to you. So God says, okay, you're going to see what kind of carbon he'll bring up, and God causes the akeba. The second medrash says the words were not Satan's, but the words were Yishmael's. And they weren't directed to Avram, they were directed to Yitzchak. Yishmael turns to Yitzchak and says, hey, you think you're such a big deal because you had a bris at eight days? I was 12 years old when I had to do that. So Yitzchak has to show that he's willing to sacrifice himself in, in to respond to that accusation. Medrash. Does it, is this the shot of the text? Clearly not. Which brings us to the problem again. We're, if we're, if we're not going to take the Medrash as the answer to the text, but rather as they're teaching us lessons about what's happening. So we have to take a look at the Rashbam. The Rashbam offers, and some of you have heard this, the Rashbam offers a revolutionary approach to the Akita. One that others don't agree with, but it is certainly a way of explaining Pashib Shah. The first thing that the let's take a look at the event before we read the Rashbam. Let's take a look at the event that precedes the Akeva in the text. It's on page four. Vayi ba'isahi vayomar avi melech ufi chotzartzvo al Avram. It was at that time that Avi Melech and Fichol, his chief of staff, came to Avram and said, "We see that God is with you. Right? We want to. We want to jump on board. How do we want to jump on board?" Let's make Hishava Libe Lokim pray, uh, swear to your to God if you will deal falsely, Li Ulanini Ulanechti. If you will do falsely to me or to my child or to my grandchild. Right? I want there to be an intergenerational covenant. Like I treated you pretty well, treat me, etc. So what does Avram say? Immediately, Anochi Shaver. Yes. And then in the next sentence, he yells at Avimelech. He says, But I want you to know you stole my well. To which Avimelech responds, Lo Yadati, I never saw it, I didn't do it, I, I, I had no knowledge of any of this. Avram then goes on, and do they contract a covenant? They actually do. It says very clearly. Avram takes son uvakar, vayitel avi melech, vayichru su shneem bris. I'm looking at the underlined section, sentence in the middle. And again it says, vayichru su bris biver sheva. Again it says it, once again. But the Torah's reiteration of the fact that they it contracted a treaty an intergenerational treaty of Beersheba. Now, first of all, what do we know about Avimelech? We don't know much, but you know, it's interesting to, to spend time looking at the peripheral characters in the Torah. Avimelech emerges as someone, he's the king of the Philistines. He's not an evil man, but he leads a, a pretty evil society. And when pushed and said, you did this, what does he respond? Not my fault. Not, not my fault. Right? We've, we've heard this before. All right, again. Very good. So what could, what could the connection be between this and the Akedo? So now let's take a look at the Rashba. Turn them to the next page. And now I'm reading the Rashbam. 
page five. Page five. Kol makom shenemar achar hadvarim ha'ele. Murray was right. Mechubar el haparsha shel malo. What is happening now is somehow thematically, conceptually connected. And by the way, it may not even be immediately afterwards temporal. But thematically, it is what? It is connected to what came before. So now he's, now he's stuck. So what does he say? Skip to the next underlined section. In Hebrew, Afkan, and the English here too. Afkan Hadvarim. Here too. These events are connected. Achar Hadvarim Shekoras Avram Brislavi Melech. Lo Ulanino Ulanechto Shel Avram. After Avram contracted a covenant with Avimelech intergenerationally, obligating not only him, but obligating his <coughs> children and grandchildren. And the Rashbam now brings down that the rabbis feel this covenant was an error. It should not have been made. It was wrong. Because God promised the land to Avraham. And what? God promised the land to Avram, and you're not supposed to create a covenant with the nations on the land. And what is he doing? He is not only creating a covenant for himself, but for his progeny. I'm skipping to the next paragraph. Niso es Avram. God tested Avram. Kantaro vitsaro. He, he, not tormented, but he treated Avram harshly. And what did he say to him? You, Nitka Eta, you were haughty with what? The safety of your child and your grandchild? You took the safety for granted? Now, Lichros ben Bres ben Nechem uven ben Nechem viato lech vahaleu liola ure e maho ilu Christus Bres shelcha. You you treated him haughtily. You didn't. You weren't careful enough with the welfare of your child. Now take a look at what it might be, what it might feel like to lose that child. And this is a whole, suddenly now, the Akedah becomes something very different from what, from what we thought it was. Now, I don't think, by the way, that the Rashmam is rejecting all the other explanations to the Akedah. In other words, it was a test of Avram's faith. that it, All the other explanations, it was actually a statement that this is not what God wants because that's finally what, what happened. All of those explanations. But he is adding another layer. He's adding another layer. He's saying, in a sense, that the Akedah was a course correction for Avraham. Avraham was so anxious to what? To, to, to deal and to, to have peace with the people around him that he, didn't take for, that he didn't look carefully enough. And he didn't recognize the danger into which he was putting his child. Now again, this is a very frightening explanation, right? But I'm going to tell you something. If you take a look at the flow of the text, you find something very interesting. The Avraham that is painted for us after the Akedah is very different from the Avraham before. After the Akedah in Parshish Chayisara, you don't see Avram preaching to the world anymore. He does two things. He buries his wife. He marries off his son. He takes care of family. And I don't think that this is a rejection of all that he did before. In other words, he's not saying that 
but it's balance, right? Balance. You want to have peace? Be sure you have safeguards. I mean, one of the things we are feeling the effect now of is an apparent error that we made over the years, right? The term mowing the lawn, right? What was the term mowing the lawn? We can keep, we can keep our enemies at a <coughs> reasonable level, right? If it's okay, as long as, yeah, it's, they wrote can, can get rockets, but, you know, and we'll tit for tat a little bit, and as long as that's the worst that it gets, that's the worst. What's wrong? It was wrong, and hindsight is is twenty twenty. I'm not saying any one of us would have done any better if we were sitting in the driver's seat. I don't know that we would have, but it was the wrong decision. And and here you see centuries ago the Rashbam turning and saying, Avram went too far. And because of that, Avraham is now being tested with the potential loss of his son, just like we are being tested with some very, very serious challenges. Very serious challenges that perhaps didn't have to occur had we, had we made other decisions. <coughs> so, I, I, I hate to leave you on a downer, um, but I want, I, let's sum up what we've seen. We've seen three cases, right? Three cases where we confront a textual difficulty, where there, there are two global approaches. There is the Midrashic approach and the Pashupshad approach. Each has its place. We're not rejecting one or the other, but each has to be understood within that place. The Medrash is the rabbis wanting to transmit lessons and using the text as the springboard for those lessons. The pshat is, what does the Torah say here? And what is it, what is it trying? And, and very often the lessons of the pshat are extremely powerful. People make the mistake of thinking that because we call it sometimes pashu pshat, that it means simplistic. It's not. The pshat can be very, very deep. And as we've seen, the lessons can be very, very powerful. So we're going to be Bezrat Hashem following through with this approach as we proceed through Sefer Bereshit. I look, I'm glad that you all found your way here today. And Bezrat Hashem, we should continue to learn together for a long time. All the best.